All right, everyone. So we are getting ready to start. Rachel, good morning. So we are so excited to um, launch the Immersive Grant Writing Program. This is our informational for today. Please put all your questions in the Q&A and uh, Margaret will take a look at it and we will make sure that every, every question is going to be answered. We are a very transparent group. We talk about everything um, and anything. So please, this is not the time to be shy at all. Um, so my name is Crystal and I am the executive director of the Women's Foundation of Genesee Valley. We are so excited to be here with you all today. Um, and we are even more excited to learn from our most amazing panelists. Um, the flow of the event will start with you hearing from our um, a few of our facilitators um, about the eligibility of joining the program um, and then we'll get into the discussion of the day. When you hear about the eligibility of the program, what's really excited about what's exciting about this is that we had cohort one and we learned a lot, a ton about um, ourselves as a foundation, a ton about eligibility, um, who is the best fit for the program. And we also want to open up open it up to your feedback as well. Once again, when, what we pride ourselves in as an organization and as a foundation, which isn't um, typical isn't isn't typical, is that we are very, very transparent. We will tell you what we're feeling and what we're thinking because, this is not our foundation, this is your foundation. And so we trust you to make decisions and give feedback. All right, before moving forward, we also want to thank our sponsor for cohort two. We are so grateful for the Greater Rochester Health Foundation for your support and making resources in our community accessible to everyone. Uh, we are just so I don't even know how to express the level of gratitude that we have for the Greater Rochester Health Foundation. And I want to stop and tell it, you know, tell a story um, that we were kind of nervous to apply for funding when we saw um, this grant come out for uh, supporting communities of color because we said, well, how does this align? How does an immersive grant writing program align with the Greater Rochester Health Foundation? And what the response that we got back was just like, it blew my mind. And this person that we were speaking with said, you want to know what? It aligns because everything is webbed together. And so when organizations led by people of color are able to apply for grants and fund their organizations, they are better equipped and able to help our community, no matter what type of work that they are doing. So it aligns. So when we heard that they were willing to support cohort two, we were just absolutely positively through the roof. The missing, so I'll pass it over to um, Sid. Sid is just the most amazing person on planet Earth. Um, before we go forward, I would like to give you, talk a little bit about Sid Bell. Sid Bell is a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner in the Rochester area where she supports DEI strategy efforts and DEI education. She is a co-facilitator of DEI Over Wine, um, that is a class series at New York Kitchen. Shout out New York Kitchen. If you haven't been there, please go there. Their food is absolutely amazing and their classes are just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and she also serves as an adjunct professor of DEI at Nazareth College. Cindy volunteers as a mentor for the YWCA Equity and Development Program, a member of the, of the Friends of 540 fundraising group, and she is the board chair of the Women's Foundation of Genesee Valley. And so she is 
all over the greater Rochester area, serving all of our communities. And we are just so grateful to have you as our leader and also as the founder of the Immersive Grant Writing Program. So I hand it all over to you. Thank you, Crystal. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here. I just want to make sure if I can get a thumbs up that everybody can hear me okay, because sometimes I forget. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, to unmute. Um, welcome uh, to today's session. I am really excited to be here right now at the start of cohort two um, and welcome you formally to learning a little bit more about the program and a little bit more about the Women's Foundation and how we kind of got here um, and why this program started. Um, so we're here because we saw an opportunity to make sure that women of color have, have a chance to be in community together to learn um, more about what grant writing looks like in practice um, because of our own grant writing or our own grant practices at the Women's Foundation. So we um, have been around for 30 years. We are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. And a core part of our programming is as a foundation and to support or other organizations in our community um, that are helping women and girls reach self-sufficiency. And so I had an opportunity to work as part of the grant making committee for a handful of years before joining the board. And then once I joined the board um, and, and what we were learning in the process of doing our work is that um, the more we become aware of inequities that exist, especially in funding um, across the greater Rochester area is that we had an opportunity to be part of um, a change that could happen and equip um, a skill set that we saw was so underdeveloped in some ways. And there were a few different reasons for that that we'll talk about today um, through the panelists and everybody that's here joining us today. So um, the work that we do is really grounded in equity and inclusion in a way that we are so excited to share with this next cohort that we were able to do in our first cohort um, through the Immersive Grant Writing Program. And I'm just very excited um, to get started today. I'll go into the program goals as well, Crystal, if you want to move us forward. Um, and I'll give you a little bit more history about the program here. And so this started again as an opportunity to provide um, and build community with women of color in, in our greater Rochester community. And we knew we couldn't do that on our own, right? And so we had um, an opportunity to work with Margaret Poirier, who is here on the call today. And we have a new um, program um, uh, person joining us as well. Um, but what we were seeing is that we could um, provide the skill set and kind of share power with the community in a way that we hadn't before. And so there was a way to kind of like share what opportunities were out there in the area. Um, but I think a core part of the program that is different than others is the ability to build community and provide mentorship opportunities in a way that we don't traditionally see um, in this area. And so the biggest goal I would say is number three, empower community leadership. And so we do that by building each other up. We do that by sharing honestly and openly about our experiences in this area um, and how to really find those funding opportunities wherever they are able to exist. But helping each other along the way. It's not about competition. It's really about how do we lift each other up and share voice among the full cohort of, of folks who are involved. Um, and so we'll dive into more of the program goals and things like that throughout the questions today. Um, but I would love to hand it over to our newest team member, Ami Burl. Um, Ami is the CEO of LA Inc. Publishing and a well-established grant writing and media expert. Uh, graduating from the prestigious Columbia University, Ami's career has been marked by a diverse range of experiences in the media industry. As a former television broadcaster for the CW network affiliates, Yahoo.com, and MTV, she honed her skills as a content generator. Ami's expertise has garnered recognition on prominent media platforms such as CNN, Fox, MSNBC, Business Insider, and Yahoo News, where she served as a political spokesperson on national and international stages. Most recently, she was featured on NBC Business School programming on Telemundo in Los Angeles, California. She represented uh, the Latina community, and provided insightful questioning to industry professionals highlighting small business concerns. 
With her diverse range of knowledge and experience in the media industry, Ami is dedicated to sharing her expertise and helping individuals and organizations achieve success through storytelling, fundraising, and effective communication strategies. She is stationed out of Michigan, where we have recruited one of the best in class to deliver this course. Thank you so much, Ami, for joining our team for this year um, and for being part of this work with us. We are so, so excited to have you, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Sid. I appreciate it. I am so ecstatic to be here. I'm excited to be a part of the team, and I will talk about the program breakdown. So the program break, breakdown here, how many organizations are we opening this program up to? I'm so glad you asked that question. We're looking for 10 women organizations. There's going to be one representative chosen from each organization. Each student is allowed to assign a program backup from the same organization in case you're unable to attend a class. And then what is the cost of the program? Zero, zero cost to you. That is correct. It's just a couple of things that I do wanna highlight. Things for you to know, this program is for women of color. So we're talking about you. The assigned backup, it can be from the actual same organization. And so when we say that we're looking for a board member or a staff member. And also I wanna let you know, if you miss a class, your backup can fill in for you. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on over to Crystal. All right. So we're gonna get into program eligibility. Listen in, all ears perked up. Um, so again, this is designed for nonprofit leaders of color running a small to mid-sized organization without major fundraising support. So when, and also you do not have to be an executive director. You do not have to be in that role. You just have to be pointing towards some type of fundraising. So don't you worry about your role or your title. If you work at a 501c3 and you have been selected as a um, woman of color to join the program, that's all that is. So that is amazing. Um, going back to what we mean without major fundraising support. So of going back to our level of transparency is that there could be some organizations that are that have a lot of fundraising support within um, under their roof. And so what does that look like? We know that there are some grassroots organizations that maybe our community isn't quite aware of, but they're doing great work and they're a one person show or a three person show. So we are looking for those organizations that may not have a large fundraising budget, but they want to, they need professional development in order to go after the grants that they need. So we are coming up with opportunity, with paid opportunities for, um, and this is something that we are rolling around, that we're coming up with paid opportunities for those who have larger budgets that they can make a small um, a small contribution so that they may be able to join the program. But again, it is about equity first um, and it's about uh, intentional inclusion without barriers. And we are looking for organizations and individuals who are not typically in the spotlight uh, that we can help lift and support. Um, your organization must be within the greater Rochester area. So these are the counties within the greater Rochester area. And for cohort two, um, your organization should also serve individuals within rural areas. So that is very important to us. Before we move to the next slide, I would like to introduce to you one of our um, the immersive one of the immersive grant writing program veterans, um, the most amazing Margaret Brosner Poirier. She is the owner and founder of Grants for Good. She has what we call it has been in the paint with us from the beginning of time, and we are just so grateful for her contributions. And she's just like the most wonderful person. So in addition to being the owner of Grants for Good, you can go ahead to her website. You'll find it at grantsforgood.com. You'll also, we'll also give you the information for um, Ami's website. Ami, can you shout it out? Yeah, sure. It's la-inkpublish.com. 
There we go. So Margaret it created her company in 2009 to help nonprofit organizations and businesses find and get grant funding. And can I tell you, she's good at it, okay? She is one of 400 or so nationally certified grant professionals and one of only 30 approved trainers in the U.S. on this topic. Margaret and her team have written and received millions in grants for nonprofits and businesses, and she has the unique perspective of understanding both grant seeking and grant making, giving her experience leading a prominent New York foundation. Her passion is teaching others to secure grant funding. She's really great at that through public speaking and her online course, all about grant writing. You can go to her website to um, to register for that. It is phenomenal. Um, also, Ami has a course as well about grant writing, um, and she's spoken at national and international conferences of the Association of Fundraising Professionals and Grant Professionals Associations and others. So let me tell you, this team that we have for the Immersive Grant Writing Program is like no other. We have brought together the best of the best. As you can see, we have the best trainers. We have DEI facilitators. We have national um, spokespeople, journalists. This is just going to be off the chain, y'all. So please make sure that y'all get y'all applications in sooner rather than later. Margaret, I hand it over to you, friend. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Crystal, <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm really excited to be working with this team um, and with Amy this year, Ami rather. Um, we had a stellar first year. It, it was our, our first time and I'm still smiling from the graduation, all the incredible women that were in cohort one. So welcome everybody this morning. I'm gonna cover just a couple of more details about the program. So you know about applying and joining us for this second year of the program. So how long is the program? Well, there is definitely a time commitment. It starts September, 2024, and it finishes with a fantastic graduation in March of 2025. We have six months of programming and we'll be meeting twice a month. Now there are 18 sessions total. They're split up between uh, some of them are held in person and some of them are held online. We haven't been doing hybrid sessions and, and we haven't really talked about that, but they're going to be either in person in Rochester or online. And each class addresses every section of the grant. So when you're done with this course, there's nothing that's going to be thrown at you that is going to be a surprise. We cover everything from determining your need statement, in other words, making the case for support as to why your organization needs grant funding. We cover your work plan. We talk about what needs to be done to achieve your goals, your outcomes, and your measurable objectives. And I'm, I'm talking about evaluation that is so necessary in order to get the grant, because you have to be able to show that you're moving the needle. You're, you're, your work is making a true and great difference in the community, which you know it is. And we're going to help teach you how to show that to funders. We'll also help teach you to develop project budgets, which is really a sticking point for many people. And we'll be talking about how to find the best grant opportunities and funders for your work specifically. So you can tell it's a really comprehensive program. That's why we meet every month. There's a really important aspect to this. Um, in the next slide, we talk about um, we talk about the mentoring. If you can advance the next slide, Crystal. Um, in the next slide we talk about the um, the graduation requirements, which is that participants must have adhered to all of the attendance. In other words, you have to be there. And why would you want to miss it? When we meet in person, um, you get to know your fellow peers and same with online. There's also a homework assignment with each of these skills sessions. Those are the ones I just talked about. 
And that is something that will be completed and that Ami or I will be reviewing since we'll be teaching those skills sessions. And the entire goal of this, and we saw this work so well last year, the goal is that when you're done with this program, you have finished your grant application, whether it's your first grant application ever or whether you've already done some grant writing, but you really want to sharpen your skills and get more funding. Either way, you're going to have finished the grant application and you'll have eyes on from your skill sessions um, instructors. And there's an additional incentive. There'll be a $500 gift given to each participant to place towards any additional grant writing or professional development work that you want to have done. So um, the 18 sessions are split up as follows too. There is the skills session, which is what I've been talking about, but there's something extremely unique to this program that at this point, you won't see anywhere else. And it's what distinguishes it from all other grant writing programs. And that is the mentoring sessions. Those are run by Crystal and by Sydney. And I've heard they are phenomenal. They are game changing. These are mentoring sessions led by, by the women who have experienced the lived experience in this field. And you won't want to miss those. So there's the skill sessions, there's the coaching follow-up sessions and mentoring. So that's six months. In other words, when you're thinking about applying to this, think about four to five hours of in-person or virtual sessions each month, plus whatever writing homework. So that should give you some idea of whether it's the right time commitment for you. So how to apply? It's really simple. The Women's Foundation dot org slash grant writing has an online application it is a google form it's not terribly long check it out you can probably whip off this uh, application in 30 minutes or less but the application is coming up soon it's on may 29th and the candidate announcements will be made in mid-july if you have your calendars out, the first class is September 18th, and we're super excited to get started with you. And finally, our list of 2024 graduates are on the Women's Foundation website, so you can read all about them. And you can see that they are from organizations from all throughout the greater Rochester region, from St. Joseph's to House of Mercy, to um, the Esther Project, Dress for Success, Father Tracy Advocacy Center, Rock Royale, Healthy Baby Network, and so many more. And they are now doing incredible things in this community. Step back, they have been doing incredible things in this community. Now they're getting the funds to really, really scale it up. So congratulations to the graduates. And I'm going to hand it back to Crystal. Awesome. And we're, you know, just to echo that, look at this group. They're just absolutely phenomenal and we're just proud of them. So we encourage you to reach out to them um, so that you could learn more about the program. You are going to <clears throat> you are going to also hear from them throughout the course of the program as well. So get ready. It's going to be the bomb.com. All right, so now we are going to get into, I'm going to um, stop sharing in a bit, but now that we have passed the eligibility discussion, we are going to talk about how foundations are lifting their communities, removing barriers, and supporting leaders of, co of color. Before we do that, we know that Rachel will be joining us at some point during the call. So before um, heading into our discussion, I want to introduce her before she jumps in at some point. She is um, the program officer at the Greater Rochester Health 
Foundation. Um, previously, Rachel was the Data and Engagement Project Manager at Connected Communities, Inc. During her first three years at the organization, Rachel established the Resident Ambassador Program and helped create a framework for community engagement in the Beachwood and Emma neighborhoods. Shout out to Dr. Lashonda Leslie. She is doing great things over there at Connected Communities. Um, she later transitioned to data management and collection. Uh, Rachel also teaches freshman writing and urban studies at Eastman School of Music. She is a 2021 graduate of the Leadership Rochester in 2020. Two. Um, she joined the Family Promise of Greater Rochester Board of Directors, where she is a member of the Endowment Committee. Rachel previously earned a master's in English literature from the University of Rochester and a bachelor's of science in biology from the Center College in Dansville, Kentucky. Um, in her spare time, she enjoys trail running, ooh, okay, with friends, reading, and spending time with her two bunnies, Coco Puff and Olive. So we can't wait to welcome her once she jumps on. So we are going to stop sharing and just let us know if you are able to see us right, um, see our faces, and we're going to transition to the chat. We're going to give Rachel a few minutes to jump on. So please let us know if you see us. Hey, I am on it just for some reason has your name on it and I don't, I guess I have to rename it. The link you gave me just goes right to your name. Oh, okay. Is that you, I Rachel? Think. Yeah, that was me the whole time. <laughs> and I was like, did I have the wrong link? But yeah, sorry. I said, Rachel, let's go. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good. Okay. All right. So I was just like, where's my, where's my friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why it was like that, but okay. Okay. All right. How is it? Can you do that? Can you jump in now? Yeah, one second. Let me just have a minute to fix this video, my camera. You got it. Hey, we've got some questions in the Q&A. Do you want me to ask a few of those now? Yes, please. Hey, okay, Andy. great. Yeah, we've got um, Angela asked if the um, the partner, the person who would come with you when you can't attend, if they can be male. Hmm. You know, I'm not opposed to that, but let's get back to that. We're going to get back. Let's get back. That's the first time that we've been posed, um, presented with that question, because this is a program specifically for women. But we'll definitely um, think about that and get back to you. And there's another class question from uh, Tamara Howard and asked, will there be a list of class dates ahead of time? And yes, there will. We're meeting to determine those now. We have the first one though, September 18th. So we would definitely get those out ahead of time so you can plan ahead in, in your schedule. Yeah, that's it for now. Those are the questions. All right, cool beans. And yes, and also no, we wanna give you a clue in as well. So there are two meetings per month. The, do you see this? This is the new Zoom update. And so if you all have the Zoom update, if you put a heart up and all kinds of different things, all kinds of cool things will happen in the Zoom. All right. So there are two, there's two meetings. And so there is a grant writing session where we break each section of a grant down. So that's the first class of the month. The second session is your coaching and your mentoring sessions. So be prepared to spend at least an hour and a half to two hours on a call or in person. By the end of the program, you would have finished a complete grant ready for submission. Last cohort, the um, because of the wonderful teaching style of Margaret, there were individuals who were just so far ahead that they actually started to submit grants while they were in the program. Um, and so by month four, uh, over $100,000 of grant dollars were secured by individuals who had never written a grant 
a day in their lives. So that is how powerful this grant, um, this grant writing program is. It just gets you up and running. There is a community of, um, of women here to support you. Another benefit of the program as well, and we'll like to get to that, is the etiquette um, business etiquette portion, where we have one of the top business etiquette coaches in the nation to visit Rochester. It takes, um, they are just phenomenal. The business is called Professional Courtesy and the teacher is called, the instructor, is, um, her name is Karen Hickman and she has actually hosted in the White House and was also hosted um, a former first lady, Barbara Bush. So it is a eight hour course. So if you are indeed accepted to the program, you'll get that, you will get that date. It is a full day um, course where we learn about how to host a donor, um, how to sit for a three course, three to four course meal, um, domestic business etiquette, and also international business etiquette. So we are giving you the full firepower. Also, we have access to AMI, which is um, one of our grant facilitators, who will also be teaching you um, public, uh, public speaking skills and how to get pitch ready, elevator pitch ready. So we have the best of the best here for this program, all right? We are going to start off with some juicy questions. Again, please put all the questions in the chat. This is not the time to be shy. And if you talk to any of the graduates, they will tell you we talk about all the things. All right, so I'm gonna start it off by asking um, Sid. And Sid is also a facilitator. What specific challenges do nonprofits led by people of color face in accessing funding? What do you think some of those challenges are? Yeah, thanks for that, Crystal. And I'll ask our partners to also jump in. But one of the main things that we saw last year in our conversations with cohort one, but also what we know to be true historically, we hosted a really fantastic webinar as our kickoff last year um, with a couple of professionals, one being Dr. Myra Henry, um, who runs the YWCA in the greater Rochester area. And one of the main parts of that conversation is what the data tells us to be true about the underfunding that goes to, or the lack of funding that goes to um, women of color and people of color run organizations organizations. Um, and I'm sure there are a variety of reasons for that. But one of the um, ones that we know is from in, uh, institutional and structural racism, and how that has embedded itself in the way that we operate. And all of us are susceptible to being part of a system that operates that way. And so when we know that to be true, and we know that's how our systems operate, it takes individuals and teams of people and organizations to make an impact on changing that. Um, so super thankful to the Greater Rochester Health Foundation and to ESL for seeing opportunities to interrupt those practices and see the value of making sure that we are pouring into um, um, uh, excuse me, <laughs> organizations run by people of color, um, but it is not necessarily the norm. And so while we have Ami and Margaret who know how our systems operate and can kind of help teach to what we know foundations are looking for from the grant applications and from like kind of the way things are operating, we are doing the both and of seeing how the system works and equipping ourselves to um, access funding that's there while also changing the system as we do that. And so we're having really honest conversations with more and more foundations and saying, what are your equitable grant making practices? What do those look like? How are you educating around them? How are you reaching communities of color and organizations that are run by people of color um, and employ people of color and making sure that there is an equity lens that's being applied to every single part of that process? Um, and I'll never forget, we did a session last year, Margaret, Crystal, and I, um, and spoke to a room full of people about this program and talked about how much we're learning from the women who are part of the first cohort and what Crystal and I have experienced in our own um, kind of work in nonprofits. 
And someone came up to us after the fact in tears. And she was the photographer for the event. She said, I thought I was crazy because I was not seeing the amount of fund funding coming to my organization that my peers were. And I thought it was me. And I thought there was something wrong with the way that I was doing things. And to hear this group speak about those realities and the data that's been collected around it. And to see, see this woman in full tears, knowing that she wasn't making it up. And it wasn't just in her head that she was experiencing that. I think it was another um, like kind of anecdotal and real evidence of, of the challenges that are faced and why they exist and what this program is really setting out to do to make those changes. Yeah, that's, that's so good. And it was just moving for, it was a wonderful talk with many foundations in the room and to see that raw emotion. And we're very real in our program. We, we looked at the data across the nation and it is a true fact that we cannot avoid or act like it doesn't exist, that organizations led by people of color are grossly under funded. And so it took a lot of, um, Sid, I, I'm thinking of the word that I want to put forward, but it took a lot of courage from the Women's Foundation to say that out loud, to make it become a thing and things become things when we start to talk about them openly and that we needed to do something about it because those who are truly lifting our community are in places where we don't hear their voices. They're not in the funder rooms. They're not, um, you know, we don't see their applications often either because they don't, some of them don't even believe that they can actually submit a grant. It's also just a mindset to say, hey, you can submit a grant and you don't have to be a huge organization. We want to see you and we want to support you. And so that is a part of our, our mission. Rachel, so question for you. And I know that um, the Greater Rochester Health Foundation has such a strong track record in this and especially um, with your leadership team, you are just, this. your entire organization is going for the gusto when it comes to supporting communities of color and BIPOC-led organizations. So how important is it for foundations to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion within their own organization and grant-making practices? Hi, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, we're seeing a huge shift in philanthropy right now. I think like on the broad spectrum um, nationwide, there is a huge shift towards prioritizing diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, there is, you know, a lot of focus towards those groups because those are the groups that have been historically marginalized, marginalized and cut off from those money. I mean, a lot of the money that is in philanthropy and foundations were, you know, it was created off of the backs of BIPOC people um, and communities. And so there is a huge push to get money back into those communities who have been stolen from and historically disadvantaged. Um, at the Greater Rochester Health Foundation, which is what I can speak for, we really look towards diversity, equity, inclusion, and seeing that there is a shift in focus towards that. We think that communities should be served by people who are representative of them and who understand them. Um, we are huge on life and lived experience and our belief that that is the knowledge that is really necessary um, in working in these spaces. You know, it's not just the degree or where you're, it's where you're from, it's the experience you have and your ability to relate to people in the communities that you serve. Thank you. That's so, yeah, that is something that we look at when we look at grants at the Health Foundation. We can tell, that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell, you know, while you're on that topic, we'd love to hear more about some of the collaborations that you've had with organizations since you all started to move heavily in this direction. And what are some of those success stories that you saw rising to the top? Um, I think that we've really worked on engaging with more grassroots organizations. So that's what I will speak to. Um, when people think about health foundation, they think about health care. So like, are you funding these large health care initiatives? Are you funding like anything related to medicine? Um, we don't 
I mean, we do that, but we are really more focused on health in a community sense. So like how does health affect communities? How can communities have health? We look at all the social drivers of health as things that influence health outcomes. So we're not just focused on big picture, like medical care and like the hospitals. Cause I, I bring that up because that's what a lot of people think when they think about the health foundation. And in the past we have funded things like that, but we've had a real big shift. We really are looking to fund and do fund a lot of grassroots, small organizations led by community. Um, I've been at the health foundation for a little over a year, but I will share um, a story where this is one of my grantee partners this year, 441 Ministries. They have a housing tenant program where they've hired someone from the community. Mm -hmm. He is BIPOC, he's their um, housing manager and they've hired him to like manage and help all the tenants. And it goes beyond just did I get rent? Is everything working? He um, speaks with tenants, has meetings with them and really like talks to them about what their needs are and what could improve their health outcomes and how can he can um, you know get people to those services. This is a small grassroots organization. He's helping like 19 people, I think. And we've, they're starting to see like 70, 80% of tenants attending these meetings, which is huge if you know um, tenant trust in landlord relations. So that's what we've seen this year, which I think is like a really big win. And that's a small grassroots organization. They work in one neighborhood, um, Beachwood, Beachwood in Rochester. Um, and we've seen kind of fe people feeling supported people actually getting what they need. They had a whole basket of groceries this year instead of just like a, they give out gift cards because people said that's what they needed to really help them through the holidays. They do like potlucks and people have been starting to like make recipes and bring them and share and build community. So it really goes beyond just like thinking about healthcare in the medical sense, but how can we build community and relationships in community because that's a huge health issue. Thanks so much. I don't know if you say more, but that's I think that's like an illustrative example. We fund really small organizations. We fund organizations that are like fiscally sponsored, so that don't even have, you know, aren't even having a five hundred one c three status. You know, we fund organizations that are middle size and larger, but there is a big emphasis on grassroots. We like to support communities working in community with community. Thanks for that, Rachel. Um, I think that speaks to a lot of what we talk about around how to how do the foundations play a role in changing the system, right? And being able to see the reality and how important um, a role DEI plays in that practice, and how do we influence um, other organizations to or in other foundations to do the same. Um, I will pose this question to Ami. Um, what barriers are you all facing with obtaining funding for the organizations that you're working with? Or is there anything that stands out to you as kind of a major barrier, um, maybe that we've mentioned or that you have seen in the organizations that have come to you looking for support in their grant application, grant writing practices? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I would definitely say there's numerous barriers. I know we talked earlier in regards to the funding aspect of things. And I would say specifically with nonprofits, you see that they have lower revenues coming in from donations and from grants. And it was recently a survey done by Sage Journals, and they talked about how they surveyed over 200 nonprofits, arts and also social services. And they did that by utilizing the 990s and comparing the census data. And they found out that this funding gap really exists between those nonprofits that are led by people of color, and they're receiving less funding approximately around 24% less funding than their white led counterparts, okay? And so when that's happened, we definitely know that that is a significant uh, underfunding for BIPOC organizations. And so I've seen the lack of investment in leadership development, utilizing the unrestricted funding. Also, in addition to that, I feel as though funders tend to sometimes prioritize uh, the shorter term projects. So it's not multi-year projects. And I think that's something that's really needed and necessary for capacity building. So I would say those are some of the things that I, I see as challenges. 
Thanks, Amy. I think it speaks to one of the things that we've really tried to make a change with at the Women's Foundation is how do we share power with? So anything that we do is not about us being able to say that we did it. It's about being able to say, look at what these organizations are able to accomplish in partnership with us um, and really being able to center the organizations that we're able to support. And I think it speaks directly to what you're talking about. Yeah. And I also think too, I'm always, I'm very solution oriented. And so I'm always like, okay, well, what can be done? What can, what can we do? Right. Especially like foundations and funders, what can they do to make the situation better? And so I would say to streamline the process, you know, don't make it so cumbersome when it comes to filling out these applications. Okay. Um, I will also say maybe look into possibly having a mixer, have a mixer, do some networking with those organizations that's doing the work that you're looking to fund. OK, so those are some things that I think can really, really help, even if you're going to maybe even have a business expo where you have these organizations so we can have real conversations. So that's what I would also uh, provide as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So the question that we have and just drop it in the Q&A um, is that what barriers are you all seeing on this, not on the panelist group, but all the members a part of the group today? What kind of barriers are you all facing with obtaining funding for your organization? Also want to shout out, let me tell you why this program is super important, why it matters, why it should be funding funded is because on the, on the Q&A, we have someone in here from Oklahoma. And so cohort one, we had so many um, people apply from different states. So let's break this down. We're here in Rochester. We have countless nonprofits across the nation. We know that organizations led by individuals of color are grossly underfunded and organizations led by women of color are grossly underfunded. So we are just in the corner right here in upstate New York, and the need is so grand that someone from Oklahoma has found us. Let that sink in. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I wanna give you a shout out because we wanna get your, um, I have your email, so we're gonna reach out to you, but there is there is a need across the across the nation for um for this program so shout out if you know anyone who wants to participate in this program who wants to help support this program please let um please let us know as well and you'll learn how to do that as well during this program is that there's always an opportunity to showcase your your um, your program and also to ask for funding you will be so comfortable in doing that at the end of um at the end of this cohort experience so shout out to people, um, shout out to the folks there in Oklahoma who have joined this program. We're gonna make sure at the Women's Foundation, we are re really working hard on making this happen um, nationwide and it's coming sooner than you know. So, but we're gonna have some interesting opportunities, but it's sooner, it's sooner than you ever think. So yes. Um, so Margaret, you are just like, super teacher when it comes to grant writing. And so from your perspective, how important is it to have a grant writer on staff or involved in the organization, especially for smaller nonprofits? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Crystal. I think one of the biggest challenges, especially among smaller nonprofits, and by that I mean they may not have any paid staff. Maybe someone's been doing this on their own time and needs to get paid. We saw a lot of that in cohort one. Or maybe smaller nonprofits that don't have the budget yet to hire staff. And so what we saw is that so many women believe that, well, how can we get grants? Grants are only for big organizations. And that's one of the myths we debunk right away is these grants are for you. They are for women-led, for BIPOC-led organizations, small, medium, or large. But smaller organizations, as we heard Rachel say, 
are funded by the Greater Rochester Health Foundation, and they are funded by so many of the 100,000 private foundations located throughout the U.S. Granted, those aren't all interested in Rochester-based organizations, but there are so many foundations out there, and there are some that are a perfect fit for the work that you're doing. How important is it to have someone on staff that knows about grant writing? It's critical. It's very important. You don't need somebody that is hired as a full-time grant writer on your organization. You don't need to spend a lot of money to contract with a grant writer and have them write grants for you. You may not even need somebody on your staff part-time doing this, but you do need someone that is invested in learning the skills and learning the whole process, the nuances that go beyond writing a grant. Because what we're teaching and what we believe is so important in this program is, first of all, knowing that you are the organization that can get grants, knowing how to find the funders and how to work with them. Funders are only people, right, Rachel? <laughs> Wait, we're only people. So it's initiating those conversations. It's having people come out to your organization to see firsthand the important work that you're doing and the impact you're making on the community. That's all part of this course. And it's all part of that bigger process. It is so much more than writing. So yes, it's important to have someone to know those skills and also to have someone who is willing to pick up the phone and start up those meetings with funders, as it is important for foundations to be open to doing that in the community, to seeing the work on the ground. So good. We have something in the we have something in the chat. And so we asked what are some of the challenges? And so we saw that knowing where to find appropriate funding, um, budgets and audited financials often requested with grants, no budget to afford it. Um, so that is something that we will address. And if you know that you're under a certain threshold when it comes to your budget, you do not have to have audited financials, but you uh, you can present a review. And so um, we will give you a list of organizations that you can go to to get a review done. So that is something that is um, um, okay, the chat is on. Okay. Uh, so that is something that we'll talk about that. Yes, depending on your organization and the amount of dollars that you bring in your revenue, you do not have to have audited financials. We also, during this program, introduce you to other funders that are um, that is aligned with your mission and vision. So we actively seek out funders that can come in and that can learn from you so that it'll be on their radar for funding. Um, seeing here, absolutely a great need. I've been searching for something like this for years. Come on, somebody. We're Let's go. Exciting. Um, yeah, we have felt the pain in not knowing where to turn. Challenges, knowing knowledge on how to write a grant and what goes into it. Well, um, if you're indeed accepted into the program, you will know all of those things. We plan on offering this immersive grant writing program for women of color for a, re a really long time. I, I you know, for those, for Sid, and also for me, I would love for you to chime in. For Rachel, I would love for you to chime in. But we are very vulnerable and transparent. And I could tell you that that is something that we considered when I was named the um, the executive director of the Women's Foundation of Genesee Valley. And we on, we we considered the fact that I am a woman of color and that there could be a possibility that the successes that we've seen in the past um, could possibly, it could be impacted because of the color of my skin. And we couldn't act like it's not true. So we even had to adjust um, our budget, hoping for the best, but also knowing that there are some barriers that even I will face as a woman of color leading leading a foundation, an endowed foundation. That's, um, it's unfortunate, but it's also a beautiful thing 
because we are now other foundations and other foundations and leaders are opening their eyes and there's been just like a beautiful changing of the guard where this is coming to the top and everyone is like we just want to help our community and fund equitably when while removing the barriers so if I can just chime in really quick on that, um, and I appreciate you sharing that because I know that that was, we had a lot of really uh, kind of heart soul conversations in the time that you were interim ED. And then when we welcomed you as our full-time ED, and we were so excited to do so. Um, I think when, when we talk about what that looks like in practice and trusting your experience and trusting what you know to be true from your many years of being in fundraising and running your own uh, company is that we also as a board said, okay, what does, what does our role look like in making sure that Crystal is supported as our new ED? And we have a racially diverse board. We are all women on our board but we do have a racially diverse board. And so we know that what comes with um, being a person who lives um, with white privilege, so I'm mixed race and, and I'm light skinned. And so I know that there's an inherent privilege in that as well. And so what we talked about very honestly is what does our allyship look like in support of our organization and more, more importantly, in support of Crystal. And so it really was an honest conversation around how do we all show up for this organization, maybe in a different way than we had before for um, and making sure that we were having very honest conversations with our community in what our organization was looking to do and what our practices were going to be and how we all had to step um, probably into our power in a different way and use our voices more um, more loudly and more directly in a way that really made sure that everybody knew who we were as an organization going into um, this new decade and being able to support both Crystal and Jasmine, who is our um, program coordinator, program and development coordinator, who is wonderful and on the call today. Um, so we are collectively working toward change as an organization and as a community. Um, and we had to be very clear on what that looked like in practice. And we are super thankful um, for the many conversations that have been had with our partners, with our board, and with past board members um, about our forward motion. Yeah. Rachel, I know that uh, the Greater Rochester Health Foundation has been doing, um, has implemented some strategies for more flexible funding options and support. Um, can you talk more to that or even just like how you've made your grant uh, submission process much easier yeah so um we've done a, a lot of things so i will just share some highlights i will kind of like echo Margie's statement of like just streamlining the process that sometimes you don't have to be a professional writer to be able to submit a grant um we've really shortened i'll speak to just our responsive grant strategy otherwise i think it'll be too much but we've really shortened our grant application process. Um, our responsive strategy is an open call request for proposals. We open it once a year. So it is much shorter. It is three pages, single spaced um, or less, but as long as you answer all the questions. So we really like cut down on how long our grants are. And that is the only, um, well, we do have a stage two, but that is like the main writing that you'll have to do. We then, you know, either do a site visit because we value like that relationship that building and just like meeting with people and seeing the work at the space or we have a few questions for stage two and that's mainly just questions that we had come up in the proposal it's usually like two or three to just answer so we've really cut back on that we've also implemented a new platform called submittable where all of our grants come through and this allows you to i think we've gotten good feedback so far it's very easy to use you make an account you can go in there. You can have multiple people from your organization working on filling out things. You can put all of your organizational information in there and just upload the documents. That way you can have conversations with us in real time through the submittable platform. And you can also um, make changes and edits. We can like pull something if you submitted it too soon and still wanted to change things. So it allows for a lot more flexibility. We also use an unrestricted funding model in our responsive grants, which means that um, you could kind of shift funds. You do flexible funding. So if you're trying something and you've got a two-year grant with us in the first year, it didn't work. You don't have to give the money back. You can meet with us and rework some things and like try it again next year a little bit differently. 
So this allows for, we don't want people to feel like you're trying something, you want to work with community and it's not working. I got to give the money back. My program's over. We get that things aren't going to be perfect ever. And they're definitely not going to be close to perfect the first time. So we really want people to be able to shift and actually serve community instead of feeling forced into a box where it's like, I have to just do this because I have the money and I got to pay my staff. We don't want that to happen. I also saw in the chat, and this speaks to our responsive, there was a question, well, a comment about um, livable wages and salary. A lot of foundations in the area don't directly fund staffing. Through our responsive, we do fund staff. So mm -hmm. we will fund positions and staffing, and that's something that um, sometimes it's hard to find funding for. And you know, we do look at what people are saying it's going to cost to hire someone. And if it's just not a livable wage, that might not get through to the next round. So we do look at that. Um, obviously, it's up to whoever's applying to kind of say how much they want to pay their staff. But sometimes if it's just not livable or not like an equitable salary, we will kind of either have a question coming back at that or kind of maybe not move that through. Um, so that's kind of how we look at that. Um, and then just to speaking to grants, it is kind of like a strategy thing. And I think that's why it's almost important that you have, um, as Margit said, someone that knows grants. And I think we often think of that as like someone that knows how to write or is trained in writing. And I'm actually trained in writing. I was a writing professor for like, I don't know, a few years before this. Um, it's actually not the case. You need someone that knows like the how grants work and how to strategize to get money in different pockets that you need. So like we fund staffing. So if you're doing a program, you might want to ask us for staffing, ask for an, another foundation for something else. And it really helps to have someone that just knows what the foundations fund and knows how to like manage that kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, I'm just a person. I'm sitting here in my office at my house. So, you know, please, we want you to reach out to us. We love to come do site visits at the health foundation and get to know organizations, whether we give you money or can support you in another way. I've looked at some grants people have had come in for other foundations and given them some feedback. Um, you know, we we love to have conversations about that kind of thing and help people out. So, you know, please look to me and the Health Foundation is a resource, even if we don't have an open grant like currently that you are applying for. So thank you. Thank you. Ami. We have, so this is the big part, um, a, a part of the mentoring segment of our, um, of our program. Let me tell y'all something. There is a lot of joy, a lot of lifting. It was a true bonding experience at graduation where it is unlike something, I, I, there isn't words that we can have and Margaret, you could probably jump in and Sid, but the graduation, we were rooting for each other. We were just like hugging each other because we had some really deep conversations. There were tears in the room at a lot of the coaching and mentoring sessions because it's not just about the grant writing portion. It's about how do you enter spaces that typically you have never possibly been invited to or have never, you know, have never been around certain individuals before. And how do you navigate, how do you navigate that in showing your greatness and the power that is within you? Oh my goodness, here we go. <laughs> if you see it, I uh, love that. Um, and navigating the power within you to sit for you to know that you are a leader, that you are your or you're doing great work, that your um that your program is fundable. And so, what is when when we think about your public speaking and you being on multiple national networks and just recently being fe featured for one of the most power powerful um you know, Afro-Latina organizations across the nation, how do you coach women or your clients to, I guess, see their power and then be able to communicate that effectively, especially when they're scared? Yeah. So a lot of my clients show up scared. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, you know, honestly, they have to tap into, first of all, their power as far as who they are as an individual, right? And then I think that it's a lot of different ways that you can approach that. So you can approach that from a religious lens, you can, you can approach that from, you know, a spiritual lens, or you can approach that from someone just 
you know, having their in, innate power within themselves, believing in themselves, right? And so how do we get to the point to build confidence? And so that's something that we talk about. And I really want to make sure that these, you know, individuals that I'm working with, that they can feel confident. I think that that's most important. And the way that you do that is being prepared, right? So for any situation, it's good to be prepared. So that really helps to take some of the nerves off because you walk into the room and you're like, oh, I, I prepared for this. I researched for this. So I, I know some things. And I think that that helps. But in addition to that, you have to also too feel empowered on your own. So daily, what are you doing in your life, right? That's helping you to feel strengthened, to feel empowered. And so we go over to tips and tools to, to gain that confidence, whether it's journaling, that might be something that you do on a consistent basis. You know, I think it's important to make sure that the whole person is whole, right? So uh, it, it's almost like a psychological aspect of public speaking. It's not just getting on stage, right? It's also making sure that you're whole first. So those are some of the things that we work on. Absolutely. And we also that's so good going back to the etiquette course margaret i want you to talk about what you experienced during the professional courtesy business etiquette coach and just share out what you felt in that moment and what you saw what you experienced oh um yeah i was at much of that session and um you know it actually happened after the graduation that was really a scheduling because as you mentioned crystal the instructor is so in demand. So we were able to get her after graduation. And so it was really a nice experience to again, sit with all of the women in this program and experience something together. Um, the etiquette class, um, you know, some things were new, some were not, <laughs> but either way, it was it was just a great session to uh, to have and to be part of. I think where it does become important too is what Ami was talking about is maybe this is just another tool to build that confidence of, yes, I can do that. I deserve funding and I, I am in the room, you know, and, and there's, I'll give you an example, the association of fundraising professionals locally during the time, the six months of last year, when we ran this program, the Association of Fundraising Professionals held a Meet the Funders program. And I know one of the women said, well, I didn't think that was for me. And that was really enlightening because it is, it was for her. It was for all women. It was for all women of color. It was for all people. And so we had a great showing. So many of the women in our cohort showed up at that event. And, and that was really powerful in a number of ways. Right. So we're bridging, you know, we're, you're, we're becoming, we're saying no barriers and only bridges, no barriers, only bridges. And um, going back to that business etiquette piece that we have to be real, that um, things aren't changing tomorrow. All the barriers aren't going down tomorrow. We got to be real about it. And there are just some things that we should learn and prepare for as we are growing and going after um, funding. Uh, we are indeed focused on grant funding, but I do want to lift another organization in town. There is the YWCA of Monroe um, and the greater Rochester area. They have a wonderful program, um, which is called uh, Fundraising in Equity or Equity in Fundraising. Equity through development. Equity through development. If you go to their website, they just had a cohort that just graduated, but their application should be opening up shortly. It is absolutely exceptional because they teach you how to do your pitch. They look at your they look at your organization to help you create a um like business business giving opportunities. There are coaches that are involved. So we are just 
equipping women of color from all from all areas. So while we have the grant writing focus, they also have this very big picture, awesome view and teaching of how to be an excellent fundraiser. So I encourage you to check out that program ASAP. Join um join their mailing list as well so that you don't uh, miss anything from them and join our mailing list as well. So we work really hard to collaborate, especially being women of color. We shout out Dr. Uh, Myra Henry, who is the president and CEO of the YWCA. We are breaking down barriers because we know as women of color that there is no piece of the pie. We were all, and everyone were all born with a whole piece of the pie, uh, with a whole pie. And what we mean by that is that we share the wealth and the way how our community blossoms and grows is that we are able to advertise other programs that's happening at other nonprofits because that's how we all win. So please go and support the YWCA, join their uh, mailing list, and also um, look out through for their equity in development program. It is when we have some graduates on the line as well. So we are about to close out and I would all like us to talk about where do we see where where do we see the future of foundation giving as it relates to diversity equity inclusion say so i'll start with you that's a great question um so i do this work every day around dei and uh and I really love it, even when it is like really painful um, because of the realities of the world that we live in and how people sometimes view diversity, equity, and inclusion work because they either don't think it's for them for a variety of reasons, they don't believe in it. Um, but the reality is DEI work is here to support all of us. And it makes the work that we do more accessible to the most amount of people from, from every identity group. Um, and I feel really strongly about that. And my pipe dream, my aspirational goal of, of all things is to see there be a requirement in every job role everywhere to be able to understand and utilize an equitable and inclusive lens. And I think that is what foundation giving, um, that's where the future is, is can every person and I appreciate, Rachel, everything that you shared about what the Greater Rochester Health Foundation is doing. I know that this is true at ESL, our cohort one partner as well, is there is a requirement to understand what equity and inclusion looks like for your work and not only know it, but act on it and be actionable toward it um, and share it and talk about it openly and with a really deep understanding of what it looks like within that lane. And so for me, from like the future of foundation giving, my hope and I hope that by doing this program and by being able to equip more leaders with this information and through our partner organizations, especially with the YWCA, there is an ongoing learning about what equitable and inclusive giving and funding looks like in practice and knowing that it is imperfect and it will continue to change and evolve, um, but that we are learners in this space and make sure that we continue to give to that um, ongoing learning practice and support each other in that work because we can't do it alone. And I feel really strongly about that too. I have found myself... Um, overwhelmed at times by the amount of community we have been able to build through this program and continue to build in the greater Rochester area when people really believe in the power of equity and inclusion. Um, and so I hope that foundations in the future really see that benefit and continue to, to pour into it as well. Thanks so much, Margaret. Yeah, I think as I reflect on this, if we don't incorporate equity, inclusion, belonging, the losses in our world are great. And I think we would be doing humanity a great disservice by not incorporating what Sydney just mentioned. And so that's where this program is a spoke in the wheel, is one part of moving towards that to better humanity. I mean, I'm thinking big and global here, but what we're doing is a relatively small scale. The fact that 
10 women graduated last year and are doing incredible things in the community, continuing and now getting funding to scale up, to get paid. That alone is having a multiplier effect. And that's part of why I believe in this program is it's our actions, it's the program, and then it's the multiplier effect that happens long after the program ends. Yeah, thanks so much, Amin. Yeah, I would definitely say that my hope is that the future of foundation giving is more equitable for everyone, for all participants involved, and that we see a real leveling of the playing field so that everybody has the opportunity to be successful, especially those organizations that deserve it. They do all of the hard work, right? And they're not getting funded, right? So I really, I hope to see more of a leveling of a playing field for everyone that's more equitable and also transparency. I would love to see, you know, the future of foundation giving being more transparent as far as what they considered is success, right? So when they're doing those final audits and things of that nature, what are you considering so that those organizations have a chance to prepare and to be ready? So that is my hopes for the future and the, the future is bright. <laughs> Rachel? Um, I would echo what everyone else said and then to add um, a different kind of angle to that is I think that for me, the future of foundation giving, I see it as being more collaborative, not only with the community served, but also amongst foundations themselves. I think that we talk about like foundations kind of being at the like white tower and disconnected from communities, but I've also seen that we've been disconnected from other foundations. And when we're in, you know, the Rochester area, we work closely with other foundations. And I think building those connections and collaborations is important to getting people money faster, fitting people like, oh, hey, you're not a good fit for us, but you're a great fit for them. Hey, let me connect you with someone over there that I know that you can talk to directly and build a relationship with right now. So like that kind of um, future and collaborative funding, um, working with other foundations, making sure that locally we're kind of on the same page. We know each other's work. We know what's being funded. We know what they're looking to fund and we can help each other out is huge. Um, and it's something that we're trying to do. We have a what if network. It's our inner funder network that we started this year with local funders in the Rochester area where we talk about strategies. We talk about our different processes, protocols, share information and learn together about what works. And I think this is going to be something that I see is definitely needed in the future. Um, we, do, we do collaborative funding at G, GRHF with other local funders. We want to see more of that. We want to kind of get to a point where we can have an application come through and just pass it on to someone else and they don't have to rewrite an application for their program. Um, so we're all working towards that. And I do want to speak for the local funders. We've been very involved in this network this year and there's been some major progress in information sharing and knowledge. So that's kind of the future that I see need, that needs to happen just from a different kind of angle. So yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. I see something in the chat is when the need is so great, um, why did you decide to only have 10 participants in the program? Great question. Um, so there is a, a possibility to have up to um, 20 individuals because you can invite someone with you. But the reason why we've chosen 10 is for multiple reasons is the main reason is we don't want to dilute something that is so important. When there are so many, when we go up to 30, 40, 50, 60, there is just, there are some things that we can potentially miss and a grant application is so detailed that we would like to have the opportunity to properly coach you all and have some one-on-one -on -one time with you all. And that is more important than anything, more important than anything else. We don't want anyone leaving the program to say, you want to know what, it was just so much going on and I didn't get the one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching that I needed. Because in addition to that, you'll get random encouragement texts, you'll get phone calls, we'll be on the phone with you for an hour like we are just with you in the paint with you and we want to make sure that we give everyone the opportunity to experience experience that um let's see here um thank you so much Trelawney for for that um will the backups attend all of the classes um so it, de it depends we t we've had different we offer it 
to the backups that they can attend. Uh, we do prefer that they are women of color because we are talking about some extremely sensitive topics um, on the back end. And yes, but for the majority of cohort one, am I right that the partner did it? The partner did attend. And then sometimes the main person wasn't because they were either going through major budgeting things that they weren't able to attend. So we flip flopped. So we are flexible in who can um, attend. Okay, looking at the chat. Um, my dream for the future is that we never have to have this program ever again. I don't want it to exist. It's a shame that it has to exist. And I don't want to see any program like this ever again because it should not be a thing that we don't we we don't have to make these special considerations because we know that foundations and donors are looking for this look to for a program to be fundable um the reason why we do this at the women's foundation is because we've experienced the pain um as a woman of color owning a consultancy and also being a fundraiser i have experienced the pain of going unseen i've experienced the pain of oh this is such a great program and no funds come in. I've experienced the pain of having to fund things out of my pocket um, and watching individuals in our community suffer. Um, and this should be a no longer. And as a foundation, we speak very, we are transparent and we say it out loud and we're like, no more. And we are going to do the best that we can and collaborate with other organizations who believe the same. And, you know, during our, our talk at the New York State Funding Alliance, we asked ourselves, what are we willing to sacrifice? And at the Women's Foundation, we're willing to sacrifice our comforts. We're willing to sacrifice playing the game because that hasn't helped a lot of communities. And so this needs to stop. And this is why we have this program that we're opening the doors to everyone and giving them the information and the tools that they need to be successful. And we will ride with them and walk with them all throughout the, as long as you join the program. And even if you're not in the program, we are we are a resource. There's plenty of times when others have submit, are about to submit a grant to an organization and they'll call us and say, hey, can you take a look at this grant? And that's something that we've done because we want everyone to, we want everyone to win and we believe that what is for us is for us and that we are not in this um we're not in a deficit mindset or a scarcity mindset we know that today if an organization if there's five of us submitting to an organization you want to know it if someone gets it and the other one doesn't that's great but we're happy that you got it and next time for someone else and we will support you no matter what and we are fierce about the women in our and all women in our community and we are also so fierce about the women of color um, in this community because one you know when we think about the history being the first myself being the first woman of color to lead an endowed foundation in the history of the city of rochester that's a big deal and so it is in doing that in 2024 is too late and so we need to see more and so we will forever ride with you and fight with you um and we hold no punches when it comes to that because we know what the fight is for All right. Any questions, y'all? Drop them in the chat or any comments. How y'all feeling after this? Oh, and by the way, I did see it there. You can be an owner of your own 501c3, so you don't have to work for someone. You don't. I, you know, we economic self sufficiency also means wealth building, also means multiple streams of income, uh, and so you don't have to be just you don't have to be just one thing. What we pride ourselves at, um, here at the Women's Foundation that if you work for the Women's Foundation, um, you can also be a business owner as well. I am a business owner of that. I, I, I own LSK Consulting, which is a national consultancy, and so yeah, we're here for all the things. So if you own your own five hundred one c three you're in the right place you found you found us if you're looking for a place 
you found us. All right, y'all. I see y'all later. Peace. Love y'all. Thank you, everybody. Oh, oh. Look at this. Oh. <laughs> so, well, that was exciting. Let's go. <laughs> I think we all have to update our Zoom now. Oh, yes. Zoom, right? I don't know. Is it going to do it again? Cool. <laughs> I, I probably was waiting for, it was waiting for a word. Um, if funny. our panelists have some time to, um, do you all have some time that I could send a separate Zoom link and we could jump on for another five minutes? Is that cool? All right. I'm going to send yep. something to you all. All right. Hey, I'm doing shout outs. Everybody's, I see people are leaving, but shout out to all the people on here. Some familiar names, not so familiar names. Hey, to the people in Oklahoma, I left you my number in the chat. We are coming up with opportunities for you all as well, because yeah, because we have to. No person left behind here for a moment of appreciation for Crystal's glasses, too. Absolutely, 100% from, from May. Yeah, they win. <laughs> <laughs> All the things. Cool. All right, peace out, y'all. Bye, everybody. Thank you for Bye. being here. Bye. Thank you, everyone.